Exposure is a program about making films. The people who make this show are filmmakers. They've never made television programs before. Capital Cable TV presents this series so that you may share in what they have learned. Hi, welcome to Exposure. I'm Jim Alexander. Today our topic is on animation, and with us talking about animation is Judy Summers from ITV. Perhaps you could do some explaining on this little fellow right here. Okay, this fellow is, his name is Nugget. He's uh, part of a series called Nuggets, and he's basically a foam rubber with a metal armature inside, and we do stop motion animation with him by uh, the standard one frame at a time, taking a frame of them, then you can raise an arm and you know take another frame and wave and then the uh, you get the action of him waving or talking or rolling his eyes around whatever you want him to do. Yes, you have a an armature down there. I just happen to have this armature. This is uh, a rough model of what is actually inside Nugget uh, if you took all his foam flesh off. Uh, it's ball and socket joints made out of metal. This is more complicated than what you really need, say if you're doing amateur work or e even uh, with pl plaster scene a lot of times we just put wire in, say like pipe cleaners and that sort of thing. But this is more durable. I mean you can bend that until the cows come home and it won't break. Wire eventually will break just because it uh, you know, doesn't have a built-in joint. What about plasticine? These two little figures down here, are they hard to animate? Not really. It depends on the detail and uh, the size of them. As you can see, these fellows are about, uh, well, fellows and girls, are about uh, five inches high. Uh, the girl I've never used, I just made that for Klondike days as a prop, but the fellow has been in two items and his legs and arms are starting to get a little distorted because after a while, under hot lights, plasticine does get very soft. But uh, they're great because you can stop right in the middle of a film and remold his legs, and you would never notice it when the film runs by. Is it possible to combine uh, photograph cartoon type animation with little clay figures? Uh, you mean like, say, have the backgrounds done in one place and then do the figures separately? Yes. Yeah, if you have. Uh, facilities either using tape uh, to say chroma key or uh, if you've got a bit of money and you want to optically print it you can uh, do that you just have to make sure that you've worked it out the character's movement so that it will line up correctly with the background and the Irish Rovers uh, used to do a bit it wasn't animation but they used to have a background and when they would sit on something that looked like a uh, uh, say a spool of thread, right, because they were the little leprechauns, uh, they had to line it up very carefully, otherwise he might sit about a foot above the spool of thread and everybody would go, what on earth is he doing? But you can do it with uh, little plaster scene figures too. Is it hard? It's tricky. It's, I prefer myself just for time to try and make backgrounds for them. You don't have to do a detailed background. You can suggest a background by uh, going out and uh, getting some boards, say, that have nice grain in them, wood grain, if you will put them down just right and they're slightly out of focus, you've got yourself a nice wood floor, even though if you look closely at it, you'd say, oh, look, it's just planks lying down. Um, rug, cloth, you can get nice textures out of felt and make a background that'll work just fine for your little guys. So an animator has to use a lot of ingenuity. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, inventiveness. I'm looking for old bottles of wine or something, but uh, <laughs> it's really, say, you're looking for just the right kind of rock, uh, some lumps of cement. I had to make one scene that looked like a uh, sort of an old bombed out war site. I went out and got a whole bunch of chunks of broken bricks, some uh, little rocks, and some dead twigs. And it looked like uh, 
Snoopy and the Red Baron should fly over top. Oh, it's very interesting. Is it possible to do animation like outside on the grass or anything? Yes, you can, uh, you can animate anything. Uh, people, real life objects, say like a garbage can, you could have a garbage can chasing uh, some litter that people had thrown out. Or you could uh, take little figures you've made outside. Um, that's the, the marvelous thing about animation. You, you are giving life in a way to any kind of uh, object. You know. How many frames does it take to animate? Depends on what format of film you're using. If you're using uh, regular 8 or super 8 film, you run at oh no, now you've probably around 18 me. frames per second. Thank you. Uh, if you are animating with uh, 16 millimeter film, it's usually projected at uh, 24 frames per second. Now, depending on how smooth you want your animation to look, uh, you either shoot at one move per frame, which means 24 moves every second, or you can um, increase it and say just move for every two frames. However, then you get the jerkier type of animation and people will notice it. It doesn't look as lifelike. Would ingenuity be possible if you wanted to animate something that normally couldn't be moved? Yes, you can do things like it's done with mirrors. You can uh, you can sometimes take a shot of something that cannot be moved, and if you make a little model of it, you could say take a close-up of the model and make it look as though the big thing is actually moved. Say a building. If you have a little model of the building, you could have it collapse, like effects that are done in, I mean, in the big time, like uh, Star Wars movies or disaster films. But uh, then you have to sort of use trick, say trick photography or... Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, about uh, exposures and everything, do you usually use an automatic exposure or is it manual? I, don't fall. I prefer to use a light meter and take a reading and then set my uh, camera on manually because sometimes you don't want the correct exposure. Sometimes, say if you're working with silhouettes, uh, paper cutout silhouettes, you want to either overexpose or underexpose to get a haze around the characters. Um, if you're outside and, say, filming action, like not animation, where you, it's all very controlled, you want to use automatic because you never know the sun might suddenly come out and blast you or someone will turn the lights off and you want to have the uh, flexibility. But Animation is a very controlled uh, situation. Every frame is, is set up individually, and so I like to uh, set it myself. What's the smallest size of object that one could animate? Well, as small as you could photograph, I imagine. The thing is, the smaller you get, the more difficult it is to make your movements uh, even each time. Like you'll act, your hand alone, you know, shakes sometimes, and you want to just move it slightly, and you, oops, and then you say a lot of words you shouldn't, and uh, you try and move it back, but you will see that in the film, of course. So I usually like to use objects or whatever that are about the size of my hand or larger, because you have a lot of control over it then. Do you use an animation board, like with the camera set up overhead, whatever's animated? And well, we uh, work with different forms, like uh, with the 3D stuff and also with the, the cutout work. With the cutout work, at, when I do it at home, I use a regular photocopy stand with the camera shooting down. But at work, we uh, use a mirror at a 45 degree angle because that way your camera can be set up on a regular tripod. You don't need the fancy uh, thing. You just need a mirror that's large enough that you can shoot into directly. and. Uh, then you set out your papers on the bottom. It's the same sort of idea, but a lot of times you can get a bigger field and uh, your focus is a little better. And if you get really fancy, you can suspend, uh, say, a couple of layers of glass or plexiglass, shoot into the mirror, and you will get a, a feeling of depth as opposed to, say, paper on paper if you're doing cutouts. Um, you get the illusion of depth. You can make a landscape that looks like it goes off. Is plaster scene hard to work with when animating? No, I love plaster scene. 
because uh, it's so flexible. If you use a lot of hot, hot light, it does tend to soften up and, you know, your little character, you'll say, move your arm up, and then by the time you go back to take the shot, it's sort of drifted down, so you have to go over and move it back up again. But if you stop often enough and let it cool off again, it's great. You get all kinds of colors. Plasticine is cheap. And you can use it over again. Like once you've made a little man run around, you can mush him up and uh, make something else. Have you run into any problems animating besides the heat on plasticine and things? Um, sometimes when you want certain textures in your plasticine, if you're making a little person, say, and you accidentally put your thumb on him and you don't notice it, he'll have a fingerprint on his face, that sort of thing. But not really, no. Uh, when you design your characters, uh, you have to make sure that they can, they have a certain amount of flexibility and can stand. Like if you make them with little skinny, skinny legs and a big fat body, he's going to fall down all the time. Either that or his legs will kind of go... <laughs> 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 He'll just buckle on the spot. Mm -hmm. But other than that, if you get a good character that can walk, say with big feet, people with big feet are great, or things with big feet, uh, you're fine. How do, when they do... Uh cut out animation, how do they seem to make something go away in the distance, like a cowboy on a horse or right into the sunset or whatever? With cutouts? Mm -hmm. oh, it's tricky. Uh, you can go the way of like you would do with cell animation and make 14 little cowboys or uh, sometimes you can cheat and have him just moving in the spot and if your background is correct you can just zoom back with your camera if you have a zoom lens and that makes it look like he's getting kind of smaller. Otherwise, you cheat and you just have him go off to the side, and then you have him come back in again, and he's a little smaller, and then a little smaller. But that looks like he can't find his way. Oh, I would imagine. Can you animate other objects, like the sun, if you wanted it to come up, or a flower to bloom? Time lapse. Yeah, that's, as you say, time lapse, stop motion animation. Um, the whole idea is that instead of running your camera so that the film runs through constantly, you do it at a one frame per time. And you can have, like Walt Disney does all the time, having flowers opening, the, uh, the moon moving over. You can take a building as it's being built, and if you set up one particular spot where your camera is so that it, your image doesn't shake around, you can have the building be built in you know, 10 seconds. Just whoop, it goes up by taking one frame, say, every day, showing the building at different stages. You can show things growing. You have complete control over time. It's very science fiction-y in a way, but uh, you can uh, control time and make it go as fast or as slow as you want. What are some of the problems if you wanted to animate an object with a person, like if a guy wants to stick a banana in his ear or whatever? And you mean have the banana jump into his ear? Well, he picks up a banana and he goes like this and sticks it into his ear. How would that be done without running into any problems of him moving or... Well, actually, his ear? Well, he picks up a banana and he goes like this and sticks it into his ear. How would that be done without running into any problems of him moving or... Well, actually, I would... This is just personal. I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't animate a person sticking a banana in his ear <laughs> because you could just film him doing it. But it would be... F the use of animation would be good if uh, you just had him sort of sitting there. He couldn't move until you told him. And then you could have the fruit bowl attack him or something, <laughs> you know, because he wouldn't notice it, and the bananas would crawl up his leg. And what you would do is have him sitting there. You'd set the banana at one spot, go back, take a frame, move the banana a little more, take a frame, move the banana a little more, until finally the banana was up on his shoulder. And he'd have to be careful to balance it, of course. And then the banana could stick in his ear taking it all one frame at a time. Then when you went back and ran the film, it would just look like it had crawled by itself up there and jumped in. Is it hard animating to sound, or do they animate to sound, or is it added later? And It's, it's done both ways. Uh, it's nice if you've seen Fantasia, which I hope everybody's seen Fantasia. I've seen it. It's beautiful animation. There they took the music and broke it down and then animated to the music. Um, that way you have a real guideline. You know that you have, if you use your stopwatch and, and count out the time, you know you have, say, 18 frames to make uh, a dog jump from here to there. That's great. You can just, you know, 
work it all out and have them jump. If you're putting music to it later, you have to have a feel for what, you have to improvise more with your movement. You, you have, say, an idea of what the action is. Uh, a dog chases a cat up a tree. And uh, you would have to sit down and imagine with a stopwatch again. Stopwatch is very important if you're uh, working things out. And you'd start it and you'd kind of act it out yourself and mark down your times to say, oh, I want the dog to run. It'll take about three seconds to run after the cat. And then you'd work out three seconds is uh, 24 frames per second. And uh, you could work out exactly the number of frames. Then later on, when you had the film, you'd just uh, you'd pick music that would sort of match it. Yeah, what kind of music would you suggest if you were trying to animate to the music? Something with a definite beat is good. Uh, because if there's a regular rhythm, you can, it can be humorous. You can work it in with uh, some, something in your action that, uh, say, if a character is walking and you already have the music, you pick out where the accents are and you make sure that his foot always lands then. And then he looks like John Travolta at the beginning of Saturday Night Fever or something. You know, it, it blends right in because the music will give so much more life to your animation. Um, you can take a piece of really rotten animation, put good music with it, and it looks better. I mean, it's better to have good animation and good music, but uh, the two complement each other so much. Thank you for coming. I'm sure this was very interesting to all our viewers out there, and I hope you can come back so we can do another program on animation. I'm sure we didn't cover every aspect of it today. And thank you for watching. And now, let's go to some animation pieces. What is drafting? Hi, I'm Mr. Drafter. What is drafting? 
Drafting is the organization of thoughts through a series of drawings. These drawings should then be understandable by one who needs to use them. Any draftsman, regardless of how good he is, will need to use a sketch to start his work and organize his ideas. As we can see here, Tom does not believe a sketch is necessary to draw this simple cube. Yes, sir, Tom really doesn't believe in those sketches. You know something, Tom thinks that sketching is a total waste of time. He says, just think of all the time you could save if you could just skip the sketching and just draw the finished copy. Well, as you can see, old Tom's idea isn't working so well. Maybe we do need a sketch. What is necessary to draft? Well, these are the standard drafting tools. Here we can see the four basic tools of drafting. Pencils, 45 degree set square, 3060 set square, T-square, and finally the architect scale. The T-square fits snugly against the edge of the drawing board and should remain snug against the edge as it is being used. The T-square is used to draw straight horizontal lines and is a guide for the set squares. Here we can see the use of a set square. The set square is used to make vertical lines to the horizontal lines made by the T-square. These lines can be 90 degrees, 60 degrees, 45 degrees, and 30 degrees. This is the architect scale. The architect scale is used as a measuring instrument. It is important to remember that the scale should not be used for anything other than calibrating. Only set squares and T-squares are to be used to draw lines. Here we have pencils. Pencils are not as simple as you may think. In drafting, pencils are varied from very soft to very hard. Here we can see three very common grades of pencils used in drafting. The HB, 5H, and 8H. Here we can see how the differing pencils fit on a chart. At the far end, we can see a 7B pencil. This is a very soft pencil. On the other side, we can see the 9H pencil, which is a rather hard grade. In drafting, there are different ways of projecting an object on the drawing plate the simplest of which is orthographic projection. First, there is the top view of the object. The next part of the projection is the front side. Lastly, we have the left side view. As we can see, in orthographic projection, there are the three views drawn square on the plate. The second kind of drawing that can be made is known as the oblique projection. This is an oblique drawing. 
Notice that the front side of the square is on the plate, and the other two sides are drawn on a 45 degree angle. In this drawing, we can see an oblique projection of a perfect square. Although the sides look very large in comparison to the front face of this square, all lines are equal in length. This type of oblique drawing is called a Cavalier oblique drawing. In this drawing, we can see an oblique projection where the top and the sides are drawn at one half the scale of the front face. This type of drawing is called a cabinet oblique drawing. The third type of draft is known as an isometric projection. This is an isometric view of a rectangular block. Note that the sides of the block are drawn at 30 degrees from the horizontal line of the drawing plane. When drawing very large objects, such as a building in an isometric or oblique projection, the perspective view is used to show distance. As we can see here, the ruler is much narrower at the far end. This is known as a perspective view. Notice here how the object's length seems to change as the vanish point is changed. This shows the location of the vanish point is very important. Now that we have looked at drafting, you may ask, how can this help me? How could I use that stuff? Well, let us now look at some of the ways these drafting skills have been used. I'd like to thank Judy Summers for being on the program today, and I'd also like to thank all those people who sent in their films on animation. They were very interesting, and we've enjoyed them. And also, I'd like to add a special thanks to Nugget for appearing on our program.